The International Criminal Court is now in session. Ludianza La Corpona International, 8th word. Please be seated. Good morning. The court is in session. Would the court office please uh, call the case? Thank you, Madam President. The situation in the Republic of Kenya in the case of the prosecutor versus Uhuru Mugai Kenyatta, case reference ICC 0109-0211. We are in open session. May I ask the parties to introduce themselves for the record? Starting with the prosecutor, please. Good morning, Your Honor. Helen Brady, Senior Appeals Counsel, appearing on behalf of the prosecution. And I'm here today with Mr. Reinhold Galmetzer and Ms. Priya Narayan, both Appeals Counsel. Thank you. Thank you. The uh, representatives of Kenya, please. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. My name is uh, Rose McKenna Mushiri, Ambassador of Kenya to the Netherlands, representing the Government of Kenya. With me is uh, Ms. Caroline Wamaida, who is a State Counsel in the Office of the Attorney General. Thank you. I'm sorry. I am Judge Fernandez, presiding judge of this appeal. Today, I will read the summary of the Appeals Chamber's judgment on the prosecutor's appeal against Trial Chamber 5B's decision on the prosecutor's application for a finding of non-compliance under Article 87, Paragraph 7 of the Statute against the Government of Kenya. In today's summary, I will refer to the trial chamber's decision as the impugned decision. I will refer to the Assembly of State Parties as the ASP and to the Government of Kenya as Kenya. Please note that only the written judgment is authoritative. The judgment will be notified to the parties shortly after this hearing. I will start by briefly recalling the procedural history of this appeal. On 29 November 2013, the prosecutor requested that the trial chamber make a finding of non-compliance under Article 87.7 of the statute against Kenya on the ground that Kenya had not complied with her request for cooperation regarding the production of records in relation to Mr. Kenyatta. On 31st March 2014, the trial chamber adjourned the commencement date of the trial in order to allow further time for the prosecutor and Kenya to solve certain cooperation issues. In that decision, the trial chamber also instructed the prosecutor to submit an updated and revised version of the request for records and deferred its determination under Article 87.7 of the statute. On 7 October 2014, following the submission of the revised request and further consultations between the prosecutor and Kenya, the prosecutor informed the trial chamber that she was renewing her request for a finding of non-compliance against Kenya. On 3 December 2014, the trial chamber issued the impugned decision in which it rejected the prosecutor's Article 87.7 request for a finding of non-compliance against Kenya. In the impugned decision, the trial chamber determined that Kenya had failed to comply with the request for cooperation and that this failure prevented the trial chamber from exercising its functions and powers under the statute. However, the trial chamber found that even having made these factual determinations, it retained discretion over whether or not to make a finding of non-compliance under Article 87 of the statute and to refer the matter to the ASP. After considering certain factors, it considered relevant, the trial chamber decided not to refer the matter to the ASP and rejected the request. On that same day, 3 December 2014, 
the trial chamber also rejected the prosecutor's request for a further adjournment of the start of a trial date in relation to the case against Mr. Kenyatta. I will refer to these decisions in today's summary as the adjournment decision. On 9 December 2014, the prosecutor requested leave to appeal the impugned decision, which the trial chamber granted on 9th March 2015. On 20 March 2015, the prosecutor filed her document in support of the appeal, to which Kenya responded on 9 April 2015. On 24 April 2015, the Appeals Chamber granted a request on behalf of the victims in the case against Mr. Kenyatta to participate in the appeal proceedings. The victims filed their submission on 5th May 2015. Finally, on 8th May 2015, after having granted leave, the Africa Center for Open Governance filed observations on the appeal to which the victims in Kenya also responded. Mr. Kenyatta did not participate in the appeal proceedings. I will now turn to the merits of the prosecutor's appeal. The prosecutor raises two grounds of appeal. First, she argues that the chamber does have discretion in reaching its factual determination of whether a state has breached its obligations under Article 87.7 of the statute and whether this non-compliance prevented the court from exercising its functions and powers. However, she argues, once these findings have been made, the chamber has no further discretion. Accordingly, the prosecutor submits that the trial chamber erred in law by not automatically referring Kenya to the ESP when, after having made the requisite factual findings in the impugned decision. Under the second ground of appeal, the prosecutor argues that if the trial chamber had discretion not to refer Kenya to the ESP, it erred in exercising its discretion by taking into account extraneous or irrelevant factors and by failing to take into account or give sufficient weight to relevant factors. For the reasons that follow, the Appeals Chamber grants the prosecutor's second ground of appeal and accordingly reverses the impugned decision and remands the matter to the trial chamber. Regarding the first ground of appeal, the Appeals Chamber considers that the question to be answered is whether, as a matter of law, the scope of a chamber's discretion under Article 87.7 of the statute is, one, as argued by the prosecutor, limited to making a finding relevant to the factual determinations of a failure to comply with a request to cooperate, which has prevented the court from exercising its functions and powers under the statute, or two, whether it also includes an assessment or whether it is appropriate to refer the matter of the state's non-compliance to the ESP or to the UN Security Council. The prosecutor submits that her interpretation of the scope of the chamber's discretion under Article 87.7 of the statute is correct, based on a plain reading of the text of the provision. She also argues that policy reasons support this interpretation submitting that the trial chamber's approach would damage the court's cooperation structure and implies that the court accepts non-cooperation by states. The appeals chamber is not persuaded by the prosecutor's arguments. First, regarding the wording of Article 87.7 of the statute, the appeals chamber notes that this provision contains two clauses. The first clause contains a factual prerequisite that must be met for a finding of non-compliance to be made, namely that there is a failure to comply with a request for cooperation that is of a certain gravity. In other words, there must be a failure to comply by a state, and this failure must be of such a degree that it prevents the court from exercising its functions and powers under the statute. 
If this factual prerequisite is met, the second clause of Article 87.7 of the statute provides in the relevant part that the court may make a finding to that effect and refer the matter to the ASP. At the outset, the Appeals Chamber notes that the second clause of Article 87.7 of the statute is introduced by the term may as opposed to the term shall. In the Appeals Chamber's view, this indicates that the Chamber has discretion of whether to make or not to make a finding of non-compliance under the second clause. However, the Appeals Chamber notes that the combination of the terms may and the conjunction and in the second clause raises the question of whether the term may only applies to the finding of non-compliance which would result in a referral as a necessary consequence, or whether may refers to both aspects of the second clause, which is to say that it refers to making a finding to that effect and referring the matter. The Appeals Chamber considers that both interpretations are plausible and that under either interpretation, the Chamber retains broad discretion in its determination pursuant to the second clause. In this regard, the Appeals Chamber considers that, under the first interpretation, the determination of the factual prerequisite of the first clause is not in itself the finding of non-compliance within the meaning of the second clause, which remains at the discretion of the Chamber. Similarly, under the second interpretation, regardless of whether a Chamber distinguishes between the establishment of the factual prerequisite and the finding of non-compliance, the Chamber also retains its discretion as to whether or not to engage external actors to obtain cooperation by referring the matter. The Appeals Chamber notes that both interpretations have been applied by different Chambers in the Court. These Chambers have consistently found that they have discretion under Article 87.7 of the Statute to consider the appropriateness of a referral even when they have already found that the prerequisite of the first clause has been met. As I have already explained, the Appeals Chamber is of the view that these Chambers' interpretations are supported by the wording of Article 87 of the Statute. The Appeals Chamber therefore holds that an automatic referral to external actors, in this case the ASP, is not required as a matter of law. The Appeals Chamber is also not persuaded by the Prosecutor's policy arguments. In this regard, the Appeals Chamber considers that it is important to take into account the object and purpose of Paragraph 7 of Article 87 of the Statute. This paragraph is a, par is a part of the system embodied in Article 87, which contains the general provisions that govern requests for cooperation and the court's powers in this respect. In the Appeals Chamber's view, this final provision aims to enhance the effectiveness of the cooperation regime under Part 9 of the Statute by providing the court with the possibility of engaging external actors to remedy cases of non-cooperation. Since the object and purpose of the provision is to foster cooperation, the Appeals Chamber considers that a referral to those particular actors was not intended to be the standard response to each instance of non-compliance, but only one that may be sought when the Chamber concludes that it is the most effective way of obtaining cooperation in the concrete circumstances at hand. Accordingly, the Appeals Chamber considers that a refusal to refer a matter of non-cooperation to the ASP or the, the UN Security Council does not, as argued by the prosecutor, imply acceptance of non-cooperation, but may be based on a chamber's conclusion that a referral would not be an effective means to address the lack of cooperation in the context of that case. In conclusion, the Appeals Chamber holds 
that the scope of a chamber's discretion under Article 87.7 of the statute comprises, one, whether to make a finding of a failure to comply with a request for cooperation by a, sta by a state, which prevents the court from exercising its powers and functions under the statute, and two, a determination of whether it is appropriate to refer the matter to the ASP or the UN Security Council in order to seek external assistance to obtain cooperation with the request at issue or to otherwise address the lack of cooperation by the requested state. Accordingly, the Appeals Chamber finds that the Trial Chamber did not err in law by not automatically referring Kenya to the SP once it had made a factual determination of a failure to cooperate that affected the Trial Chamber's ability to exercise its functions and powers under the statute. The prosecutor's first ground of appeal is therefore rejected. I will now turn to the prosecutor's second ground of appeal. Under the second ground of appeal, the prosecutor argues that if the trial chamber did have discretion regarding whether to refer the matter to the ESP, it erred in the exercise of its discretion by considering irrelevant factors and by failing to consider or properly weigh other relevant factors. More specifically, the prosecutor argues that the trial chamber conflated the proceedings against Mr. Kenyatta with the non-compliance proceedings against Kenya, which led it to take into account the following irrelevant factors. One, the impact that the referral would have on Mr. Kenyatta's trial. Two, the sufficiency of the evidence against Mr. Kenyatta and whether the requested cooperation could alter that assessment. Three, that judicial measures may not have been exhausted and that Kenya's further cooperation was still possible. And four, the prosecutor's own conduct. Kenya submits that the prosecutor has failed to show that the trial chamber's decision not to refer Kenya to the ESP was unreasonable and argues that all of the factors considered by the trial chamber were relevant. Regarding the conflation of the two proceedings, the appeals chambers notes that non-compliance proceedings and proceedings against an accused before the court are distinct proceedings that involve different parties, being states versus an individual and have different purposes under the statute, being state cooperation versus individual criminal responsibility. Even where non-compliance proceedings originate in the context of a case against an accused, the interests and rights at stake are not interchangeable between these two proceedings. In this regard, the appeal chamber notes that despite previously correctly stating that Mr. Kenyatta was not a party in the non-compliance proceedings against Kenya, the trial chamber took into account its determination that referring Kenya's non-compliance would prolong the criminal proceedings against him. In this regard, the appeals, chambers, the appeals chamber notes that in considering whether a referral was appropriate in order to further the proceedings in the main case by securing compliance with the cooperation request at issue, the trial chamber held that it would not be appropriate for the proceedings against Mr. Kenyatta to be further prolonged. However, the appeals chamber observes that the trial chamber did not hold that the referral would be inappropriate to secure cooperation, but instead found that the question of whether the referral would assist in obtaining cooperation was moot due to its determination in the adjournment decision not to further postpone the start of the trial against Mr. Kenyatta. In discussing that decision, the Appeals Chamber notes 
that the trial chamber stated that its decision not to refer Kenya was quote, without prejudice to whether we request for a finding of non-compliance and referral to the ESP may be appropriate in the context of any continuing investigations conducted in the Kenya situation, end of quote. The trial chamber held, however, that any such request would need to be dealt with by way of a separate procedure before the competent chamber. The Appeals Chamber considers that the referral could have an impact on future cooperation, including for ongoing investigations, even if it, if it is considered inappropriate for purposes of continuing criminal proceedings. Accordingly, the Appeals Chamber considers that future cooperation by a requested state is a relevant factor to be taken into account when deciding on the appropriateness of a referral. However, in the present situ situation, the Appeals Chamber is of the view that it is for the trial chamber and not another chamber to decide on the matter. Regardless of the adjournment decision and the subsequent withdrawal of the charges against Mr. Kenyatta, the Appeals Chamber considers that the trial chamber was and remains competent to decide on whether it would be appropriate to refer Kenya's non-compliance to the ASP. Regarding the sufficiency of the prosecutor's evidence and whether compliance with the cooperation request could change that assessment, the appeals chamber recalls that the trial chamber held when considering whether to refer the matter that the possibility of obtaining the necessary evidence even if the revised request was to be fully executed, is still nothing more than speculative. However, in the context of reaching its factual determination under the first clause of Article 87.7, the trial chamber held that Kenya's non-compliance impinged upon its ability to fulfill its mandate under Article 64 and in particular, its truth-seeking function in accordance with Article 69.3. The Appeals Chamber notes that Article 69.3 provides in the relevant part that the court shall have the authority to request the submission of all evidence that it considers necessary for the determination of the truth. The Appeals Chamber is of the view that it is within a chamber's discretion to consider whether a particular factor affects the determination of a failure to comply with a cooperation request or to refer the matter of non-cooperation or both. However, the factor must be assessed consistently throughout the decision. The appeals chamber considers that the trial chamber's assessment that the impact of any evidence that would be derived from the full implementation of the revised request was nothing more than speculative, clearly contradicts its finding that Kenya's non-cooperation with the revised request impinged upon its truth-seeking function in accordance with Article 69.3. In the Appeals Chamber's view, this patent contradiction makes the first assertion unreasonable and calls into question the second one. Indeed, the Appeals Chamber considers that these contradictory findings raise the question as to whether the trial chamber made a proper determination of a failure to cooperate of a certain gravity as required by the first clause of Article 87.7 of the statute. In this respect, the Appeals Chamber considers that if the trial chamber was uncertain about the importance of the potential evidence, it is unclear why it concluded that the lack of the requested evidence prevented it from exercising its functions. Second, the appeals chambers also considers that the trial chamber's conflation of the trial proceedings against Mr. Kenyatta and the non-compliance proceedings affected its consideration of whether judicial remedies had been exhausted 
or whether there was still a possibility that Kenya could cooperate. The appeals chambers considers that the trial chamber did not make a clear finding as to whether judicial remedies had been exhausted. In this regard, the appeals chamber recalls that the trial chamber stated that it considered it appropriate to decide on the prosecutor's request because, quote, allowing, allowing a further adjournment would be contrary to the interest of justice under the circumstances, rather than because the chamber finds there to be no possibility of further cooperation, end of quote. The Peace Chamber considers that the conclusion that a deadlock is reached with regard to a cooperation request is a key factor to determine the existence of a failure to comply with such a request. Regarding the prosecutor's own conduct, the appeals chambers considers that the conduct of the requesting party, in this case the prosecutor, may be a relevant factor if the actions of the requesting party have negatively impacted the requested state's ability to cooperate. Furthermore, the appeals chambers reiterates that it is within a chamber's discretion to consider whether a particular factor is relevant for its determination on either a failure to cooperate or whether it is appropriate to refer the matter of non-cooperation, or both. The same factor may be relevant for both aspects and may be taken into account more than once, provided that the factor is assessed in a consistent, non-contradictory manner. In this regard, the appeals chamber notes that the trial chamber took the prosecutor's conduct into account in reaching its determination that Kenya had failed to comply with the request to cooperate under the first clause of Article 87.7 of the statute. Indeed, the Triad Chamber determined that Kenya had failed to cooperate, notwithstanding the Chamber's concerns regarding the adequacy of the prosecutor's approach to litigation. Given that the Triad Chamber had already determined that the prosecutor's conduct had not adversely impacted the obligation of Kenya to cooperate, the appeals chamber finds that it was contradictory for the trial chamber to later consider the same conduct when rejecting the application to refer the matter to the ASP. Accordingly, the appeals chamber considers that the prosecutor's conduct was not assessed in a consistent manner and the trial chamber therefore erred in its assessment of this factor for the determination of whether to make a referral. In conclusion, the appeals chamber finds that the trial chamber erred in the exercise of its discretion by conflating the non-compliance proceedings, non proceedings against Kenya with the criminal proceedings against Mr. Kenyatta, by failing to address whether judicial measures had been exhausted and by assessing the sufficiency of evidence and the conduct of the prosecutor in an inconsistent manner. The appeals chamber finds that these errors materially affected the trial chamber's decision not to refer the matter of Kenya's non-compliance. The appeals chamber is also of the view that these errors prevented the trial chamber from making a conclusive determination on the existence of a failure to comply with a request to cooperate by the court, to cooperate by the court, which prevents the court from exercising its function and powers under the statute, as required by the first clause of Article 87.7 of the statute. Accordingly, the prosecutor's second ground of appeal is granted. Having found that the trial chamber erred in the exercise of its discretion and granted the prosecutor's second ground of appeal, I will now turn to the requested relief. The appeals chamber notes that the prosecutor requests that if the second ground is granted, the appeals chamber either make the required findings and refer the matter to the ASP itself or remand the matter to the trial chamber with instructions. 
the appeals chamber considers that, as a general matter, chambers of first instance who are familiar with the entirety of the proceedings are better placed to identify and assess the relevant facts and circumstances in order to decide whether engaging external actors under Article 87.7 on this, of the statute would be an effective measure to foster cooperation. Furthermore, in the circumstances of the present appeal, the appeals chamber is not able to make the necessary finding on whether or not to refer the matter to the ASP in the absence of a conclusive determination by the trial chamber of the factual prerequisite for such a referral. The appeals chamber therefore considers it appropriate to remand the impugned decision for the trial chamber to determine whether Kenya has failed to comply with the cooperation request that has prevented the court from exercising its functions and powers under the statute and decide if that is the case whether or not to refer the matter to the ASP. The Appeals Chamber has provided further instructions to the Trial Chamber in this regard in its written judgment, which I will now not summarize here today. This concludes the summary of the Appeals Chamber's reasons for reversing the Trial Chamber's decision on the prosecutor's request for a finding of non-compliance under Article 87.7 of the statute against Kenya. This also concludes today's hearing. My last task is to thank the interpreters and court reporters. The session is now closed. All rise. We will